My name is Ilko Visser. I'm a professor at Delft University of Technology. And uh, today I'm going to talk about scope graphs, a uh, new approach to name binding. Good to have you here too, Robert. All right. Um, so suppose you have a uh, designed a language. You have an idea for a language, and uh, so you have uh, scribbled on the whiteboard, and uh, you have figured out the syntax and your semantics. So this is not a new language. This is uh, Andrew Rappel's Tiger language, but uh, we're using it as an example. So you you know what your language is going to look like. Now all you need is an implementation. All right. So what what do you need to do? Well, you need a couple of things. You need to build a couple of things. You need a parser, a type checker, a compiler, or an interpreter. And uh, so that's the job ahead of you. OK, so you start with, uh, with parsing. And well, that's, that's good, because parsing, we know how to do well. Right? So you use uh, context-free grammars to describe the syntax of your language. Uh, that describes sort of the uh, the, the, the textual notation of your language, but it also describes, it gives you a way to get an abstract syntax for your, uh, for your language. And, uh, and there are good tools for turning grammars into tooling. So if you use a, a language workbench like SpoofX, then you type your uh, syntax rules and outcomes, an editor that is syntax aware and gives you syntax highlighting and all these, all these things. And it also gives you an automatic mapping from text uh, to parse trees, to abstract index trees. Uh, and there's more stuff that you can get from such a syntax definition. You could get syntactic completions where your new users can discover the language by, uh, by control spacing and getting, well, uh, proposals for possible ways to, uh, to write a program. And of course, you get syntax checking in your editor. And, uh, and so this is all very well understood, right? So we have uh, this notion of separation of concerns in syntax definition, where we have a notion of a representation. So we have parse trees or abstract syntax trees that represent the results of parsing programs. And, uh, and that representation is language independent, right? So we can talk about abstract syntax independent of, of particular uh, languages. Uh, and then we have a set of, uh, we, have a, we have a formal notation for uh, achieving these things. So we write down context-free grammars and maybe disambiguation rules. Uh, and that gives us uh, all we need to define the syntax of our language. Right? So these notions give us a language for talking about syntax. Right? So it's the, the concept that we can use to exchange information about the syntax of a programming language. And just by uh, defining, well, just using context-free grammars, what we get for free is a whole bunch of uh, language tooling, right? So tooling that is uh, that you don't have to write specifically for your language, but tools can provide it for you. So from a grammar, you can gener generate a parser. Uh, you get a syntax aware editor. Uh, you get syntactic, syntactic completion formatters and etc. All right, that's nice. So we've written a grammar for our language, and we're done. We have an editor. And if you want to know more about this, then I'll talk uh, at more length uh, about the uh, declarative syntax definition in my uh, summer school lecture on Thursday afternoon. Um, all right, check. We have a parser for a language. Now we just need to do the other things. Uh, but all the other uh, aspects of our language implementation require name binding. And, uh, well, that isn't quite so easy as, uh, as the syntax part. And uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, so what is name binding? Uh, well, name binding is the fact that we, so our parser gives us three structures for programs, but in fact, our programs are graphs because we use symbolic names to refer from one place of a program to another place of a program. Right? And it's convenient in text, uh, but in order to semantically operate with these, uh, with these programs, we need to resolve uh, these, uh, these graph links. Right? So uh, this occurs as uh, variables, local variables in, in, uh, in functions, or function calls that refer to function definitions. Or, and we have to take care of scopes. Right? So we may have deeply nested scopes, and we may have to figure out in which scope a, a variable is defined, uh, taking into account shadowing. Uh, but 
uh, name resolution we also have to do for, for types, for type names, right? We can make type abstractions and, and refer to those. Um, for record fields. And we may want to do, have to do type dependent name resolution, where we figure out what a name points to by first figuring out what a type is. For example, here in this expression, origin.x, we would like to know what x is this, uh, is this name referring to. Uh, but to, in order to figure that out, we first need to figure out what this expression refers to. And, uh, and that has a name, which refers to some declaration, which has a type, which we need to figure out what it points to. And, and then via that path, we can figure out what the uh, what, uh, record field the, uh, the x points to. All right, so that's the, the idea of, of name binding. And uh, now the question is, how do we define the name binding rules of our language? Um, or put otherwise, what's the BNF of name binding? Right? It would be nice if we could write down declaratively what the name binding rules of a language are, and from that generate a whole bunch of, uh, of tooling. Um, and that's what, uh, what this is about. So, so what we would like to achieve is uh, for name binding similar as what, what we have for syntax, namely a standard representation where we can uh, conduct and represent the results of name resolution and declarative rules that allow us to write down what the name binding rules of our language are. And then from that, derive all ki kinds of language independence uh, tooling. So to start with name resolution, that, that says, well, from uh, the use of a name, what is the, the definition of the name? Uh, and from that, we can get code completion and refactorings and all kinds of other uh, tools. All right, and, and so this talk is about scope class. That is our proposal for a common representation um, to the ASTs of name binding. Um, so what are scope graphs? Well, the idea is simple. We, we take a, uh, a program or the AST of a program and we map that to a, uh, a scope graph. And what is a scope graph? Well, a scope graph consists of scopes, which are these, uh, these circles, which may, are, are, can be connected by edges. Uh, scopes can have declarations. Uh, so these are pointed to by, uh, from, from a scope. And we can have references. Uh, references are names that point into a scope in, in which they are uh, references. And then given a scope graph, we want to do name resolution. And name resolution is a matter of finding a path from a reference to a declaration. So if you fall asleep now, this is what you need to uh, take away from this, uh, this talk. But we'll go a, look into this into a bit more detail. Um, so we have developed a, uh, uh, a formal theory around this uh, idea of scope graphs. Uh, so there's a, a calculus of name resolution, which tells us how to resolve names in, in scope graph. And it consists basically of four uh, reachability rules, and we'll look at visibility later. All right, so how does this work? Uh, let's start uh, with the basics. So we have a, a program, and uh, in these examples, I'll be uh, using subscripts for names. Uh, that is not to make these names different, but all the x's here are the same x, but at different positions in the, uh, in the program. So that's to distinguish occurrences in, uh, in a program. Um, so what we want to uh, do here is resolve uh, a reference, uh, the reference x2 to the declaration x1. So in this particular language, there's no definition before use. And, uh, and these definitions are uh, enclosed in a single global scope. So we represent scopes by these uh, circles. Uh, and uh, we define references by boxes with names that are pointed to from the scope in which they are declared. Um, and we de define references by boxes that point to the scope in which they are a reference. Um, and then uh, resolution is a matter of finding a path from a reference to a declaration with the same name, uh, following these basic steps. So we can go from a reference to its scope and from a scope to a declaration. And uh, well, so that's a simple uh, uh, ref uh, name resolution. Now let's look at more interesting cases. 
uh, for example, lexical scoping. So uh, another example program, we have uh, two declarations again, but now we, one of the declarations is a, uh, is a function. And, um, and so fun here is lambda. So the, uh, the Y1 is the argument of the, uh, of the function, is not the name of the function. Um, and so what we see is we have a, a global scope and we have a nested scope, which is the scope of the, uh, of the function. Um, so let's make the scope graph again. So we have a, a global scope with, uh, with two declarations, X1 and Z1, and a reference Z2. And we have a nested scope, uh, S1, uh, with uh, references uh, X2 and, uh, this is easier, right? With the references X2 and Y2, and uh, a declaration for the, uh, the lambda variable uh, Y1. And now to express the, the fact that the scope S1 is nested in scope uh, S0, uh, we add uh, an edge from the child to the parent scope. Uh, so now in order to resolve names, we can use the same rules we used before. So the local reference Y2, uh, we can resolve with the, the, the rules we saw before. Uh, but in order to resolve X2, we need an extra step. Namely, we can follow uh, a path to a, uh, uh, to, a parent, uh, to a parent scope and from there to a declaration. All right. Questions? typically arises at this point. Yes? Well, the time to ask this question, but it's something that you talked before. You talked about, uh, for instance, you gave ex examples, field names, but for field names, you need the type, the type I of the- I will get back so, to that, uh, yes, okay. yes, definitely. Yes. Um, all right, um, there's another ex question, but we'll, we'll come back to that question that you haven't asked. Um, all right. Um, all right, so lexical scoping is a matter of uh, building up chains of scope, and you can search from outer to inner scopes, uh, but, tip, but you cannot, uh, so the, the declarations in inner scopes are not accessible from the outer scope, right? They're, they're encapsulated. Uh, and now let's look at another uh, typical phenomenon in name mining, which is modules and imports. So here we have two modules, A and B, and, uh, and here's the scope graph structure for, that, uh, for those modules. Right, so the module names are declarations at the top level, and each of the scopes defines a, uh, a scope for the declarations in the module. Um, right, so we, here we have a, uh, a declaration X1, and in module A we have a declaration Z1. Uh, and, um, and these declarations are not accessible from outside. Right? They're encapsulated in the, in the module. There's no path from uh, scope S0 to uh, declaration X1, so they're encapsulated. Um, and, uh, but what we would like to do, so modules encapsulate uh, declarations, but what we would like to do is to make them available to some other modules uh, on request, and that's what, what imports are about. So this import construct is, well, itself mentions the name of a, of a module, so it's a, a reference itself. Uh, but now in order to uh, make the uh, declarations of scope of module A available in, uh, in module B, we need something extra, and that is the notion of, uh, of imports. Uh, and to model imports, we have a notion of associated scope. So with the uh, with a name, we can associate a scope. So we associate the scope of, uh, of a module with its uh, module name, um, and, a, uh, and an import. And an import is a, an arrow from a scope to a, uh, to a reference, and it's saying, well, we're going to import uh, the intention is we're going to import the declarations in the scope associated with the thing that, well, let, let's look at the rule. Uh, right, so we, what we would like to do is resolve Z2 to the declaration in module A, and uh, well, we can, uh, we can uh, go to the module it's defined in, but then we, we get stuck. But then using uh, the, the rule for imports, we can resolve, uh, we can resolve this. So what we first need to do is, so this rule says, if we, 
have an import of R1 in scope S, and uh, we can resolve R1 to uh, de a declaration R2, and that has a, an associated scope SR. Then there's a virtual edge between scopes S and uh, SR. Um, right, so, so now if we, if we resolve um, A2 over here to, its, uh, to the module name, A1, then we get a virtual edge from the scope of module B to the scope of module A, and that allows us to resolve uh, the, uh, uh, the Z variable in, uh, in the module it is uh, defined in. Um, all right, so the final pattern uh, is uh, qualified names. Um, so with import, we said, well, we import all the declarations from a scope into another scope. Sometimes we want to be more uh, precise and say we want to have a particular name from a scope. And that is what the uh, what, what qualified names does, right? So uh, here we're saying uh, module N defines uh, some name and it can define uh, lots of names, but if we want to imp use a particular name, um, so we have a static uh, access to the um, uh, to uh, declaration S1 in, in module uh, M1. Um, so how to model that? So rather than importing all of uh, module N1 into module uh, M1, uh, what we do is uh, make this uh, S2 a reference in a, uh, in a anonymous scope that doesn't well, really correspond to a block in, uh, in the program. Uh, in that scope, we import the, uh, the module N uh, and that allows us to, uh, to then well, resolve the module N to its, uh, um, to its associated scope, and then uh, via the import rule, uh, import a particular name from, um, um, from that module. All right, so that, these are the basic ideas of the, uh, the resolution calculus. It, it allows us to, so we build up uh, graphs that represent the name uh, binding facts of, uh, of programs. And using these rules, what we get is reachability in that graph. Right? So we, we can go from uh, references to, uh, to declarations, and, and these patterns allow us to model a wide range of, uh, of binding patterns. Um, but how about ambiguity? So that's the, the question I was, uh, I was expecting. Um, so what if there's two declarations that can be can be reached from a, a reference. Um, and to, uh, to deal with that, uh, we extend this calculus with, with the notion of visibility, where we can disambiguate between uh, multiple possible paths for a, uh, a reference. And uh, so it doesn't modify uh, the reachability rules, but it, 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 it gives you a predicate on uh, deciding between, uh, between paths. And we'll look at uh, examples of, uh, of that. Um, so first off, here's a, here's a basic occurrence of a possible ambiguous um, scope graph. So we have a scope uh, with two declarations for the name X at different occurrences. And that means the, the reference X3 uh, now has two possible paths, right? We can resolve it to X1 or we can resolve it to uh, X2. And so this uh, resolution is ambiguous. And what can we do about this? Yes. We could use the last definition, indeed. But actually, that's a different pattern, because in this, uh, in, in this code graph, we've defi designed, or we've defined that these dec are declarations in the same scope, so they have the same, we cannot really distinguish their order. But indeed, the pattern is saying, well, if you want to have definition before use, you could have two different scopes, and we'll see an example of that later. Basically, the, the let pattern is, a, is an example of that, uh, where you say, well, now we can distinguish, we, can, we, uh, we want to prefer the one that's closer. We'll see in one slide. But in this case, we could say, well, this is just wrong. Right? I mean, this is a scope, and it has two declarations of the same name, so that is, that is wrong. Uh, still, we want to be able to, to have scope graphs that represent that kind of erroneous information, because real programs do have these kinds of errors. So we do, uh, so we do allow uh, these things to occur, but then we can decide, well, 
uh, but this is wrong. There's two references, uh, there's two paths for this reference, uh, and so there's an error that you can display in your IDE. Uh, but, but sometimes, actually, this may not be an error. Uh, so this is uh, OCaml pattern matching, and there you can have multiple uh, patterns that define the same uh, variable, and so a reference in the body of such a, uh, of such a case uh, would refer to either one uh, of those, depending on the pattern match outcome. And here you actually have a, an ambiguous uh, resolution in, in this kind of fashion. So sometimes this may actually be, uh, make sense. Um, all right, so let's look at more interesting cases. Um, so shadowing, for example. Right, so here we have a similar example as we saw before. Uh, we have two uh, declarations. And, uh, and we have a, a lambda, but now we have a nested lambda. Uh, and uh, and uh, let's see, what is the, uh, the issue here? Right, so there's, an, uh, there's a reference uh, of x in the body of the inner, inner lambda. Uh, and there's a declaration of x uh, as the argument of, of this function, uh, and, but there's also a declaration of x at the, at the top level. All right, and we see that in the, uh, in the graph here, so we have a reference at, uh, at the bottom, and we have a, uh, a declaration in scope S1, which corresponds to the, uh, to the lambda, and we have a, an, x at the, an x declaration at the top level in scope S0. All right. Um, well, so applying the rules we've seen before, there's uh, a path from x2 to x3, and there's another path from x2 to x1. Right? So the, there's two reachability paths. And now we could, say we could try to modify our reachability calculus to try to, uh, uh, to uh, exclude this case. Uh, but instead, we say, well, we leave this reachability calculus alone. And what we instead do is uh, distinguish between uh, the uh, the paths and and so we can define all kinds of policies for defining shadowing like situations and so what we want to do here is uh, define a specificity ordering that uh, compares paths and the uh, the specificity ordering here says that we want to prefer local declarations over declarations that we find via a parent edge and uh, and then we transitively close that and that means that the red path, in this case, is more specific than the blue path. It's not necessarily the case that the paths are shorter, as we'll see in a bit. Um, uh, so the, the red path is more specific, right? And, and that exactly corresponds to the notion we were expecting, namely that the, the inner uh, lambda shadows the outer, uh, the outer declaration. All right. Uh, another kind of uh, shadowing. Um, so let's see what the situation is here. So here's the, uh, the scope graph. It's a bit similar to the modules we saw before. Uh, but so we have a module A and a module B. Module A defines Z as we saw before, but now we also have a declaration of Z at the top level uh, over here. And um, hmm. so we're interested in the resolution of Z2. What, well, so this is an, an example, uh, this is a question I asked at the exam, and so what, what does Z1, uh, uh, no, what does Z2 refer to? And of course, well, by name you say, well, it, there's two possibilities, right? It can be Z1 and Z3. Um, so we can see, well, is there a path to both of these? And if so, which one would we prefer? Or which one would you prefer? Ah, uh, that's true. Uh, okay. All right, so indeed, there's two paths. Um, so one, uh, as we saw before, via the module import of uh, module A. And the other uh, goes to the uh, uh, the parent and reaches there the, uh, the, the right. So, so Z3 is in the lexical scope of the module, so that's where we could reach it, and the other is, uh, is the inputs. Um, so now you could say, well, you could argue about what, what, is, the right, uh, what is the right thing to do. And, uh, so we don't necessarily, we don't build in this choice in our uh, calculus, but we allow uh, 
the definition of, uh, of a policy. And again, that's using uh, specificity rules. And uh, we, here we're saying, well, we prefer imports prefer, uh, are preferred over parents. So if you import something, uh, that is better than if you uh, get it from your lexical context, because you're probably importing it specifically, so that's what you want to achieve. Probably you can also make the counter argument and say that you would prefer your lexical, uh, uh, the, 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 the thing you find in the lexical context. But in this case, using this uh, policy, what we get is we prefer the red path over the, over the blue path. Uh, but we could also reverse the rule, and then we, uh, we get uh, parents' shadow imports. Or we could leave out this rule, and then this situation would be ambiguous. And that would mean uh, we don't, it's an error if something occurs both in the lexical context and in the, uh, in the imports. Um, so you can play with these rules to, uh, to tune the, the binding rules for your, for your language. I completely forgot to turn this uh, timer on. So if you can keep track. Um, all right, so here's another uh, uh, variant. So, so we said imports uh, shadow parents, but we can also say that we uh, have, instead of imports, we have uh, includes. Um, Uh, let me reconstruct. So what is this about? Um, this is about the situation we want to resolve uh, Z2, and we could either resolve it to something that's in our own scope, or it's in a module that we import. And uh, so if we say that we prefer local declarations over imports, uh, then we would uh, prefer the resolution of Z2 to Z3, uh, but if we would say, well, we have an includes policy, and that means we don't uh, specify the specificity ordering, and that would mean we don't make a choice between these two situations, and that would give us a, an error in, the, um, uh, in our IDE. Um, all right. Uh, another interesting situation, and the, the example is a bit contrived. Um, but, uh, so this is a variant of the, uh, the qualified name situation. So we have a, uh, we, we're using this qualified name uh, S2. And um, what we're saying is give, a, give me the S from module N, right? Uh, but it happens in this case that module N doesn't have an S. But there is an S in the lexical context of, uh, of N. So there is a path that says, well, uh, go fr from S via the import of N to its scope, and then take the parent edge to the enclosing context, and there find the definition of, uh, of S. Um, and so the example is a bit contrived because the, um, the scope that we're doing this in is the same scope as the lexical context of the module, but, but suppose uh, you're importing some module from somewhere else, and it, ha it has a lexical context, and you're trying to uh, get a member of that module, uh, but it doesn't have one, and so that means you get one from the lexical context. Is that a good idea? Maybe not. And, and so you, you want, we would like to be able to model that in our, in our policy. But again, you may want to say, well, yes, that's, that's an excellent idea. Uh, but let's suppose we want to forbid that kind of uh, uh, situation. Uh, what we can do is uh, define a well formless predicate on, on paths that uh, defines that paths can have a certain uh, form. And in this case, what we're saying is uh, paths should have this shape. Uh, so you go from a reference via a chain of parent edges, and then possibly a chain of import edges to a, uh, to a module, and there you find a declaration. But what you cannot do is go to an import, through an import, and then uh, through a, a parent edge. Um, so that forbids paths of, of this shape, and so it doesn't allow you to go to the lexical context of, um, um, of modules. Uh, 
10 minutes? All right. Um, so, and there's a couple of more of these, uh, of these, uh, these patterns. And uh, let, me, uh, let me skip those. Uh, well, there's only one. Um, but so the basic idea now is uh, our calculus for name resolution. So we have reachability, which allows us to find paths in a, in a scope graph from references to declarations. We have uh, a well formless predicate, which allows us to define a predicate on a regular expression on the, uh, the labels of, uh, of paths, and that, uh, that allows us to, to uh, forbid certain patterns or allow particular patterns. Uh, and we have this notion of a specificity ordering on paths that allows us to choose between, uh, between paths. And that allows us to uh, define uh, shadowing policies. So that's the basic idea of, uh, of the resolution calculus. And um, so th these were my requirements, right? So I, what, I what I would like is a, uh, a similar declarative situation as we had with syntax. So a representation that allows us to reason about name resolution. Um, so that's what I've just shown. Scope graphs are this uh, representation to represent the name binding facts of programs, independent of the particular language. Um, and now we can, we can define policies for visibility uh, in, uh, in such scope, scope graphs. Um, the next step is we would like a language for describing uh, uh, these things, similarly as we have commentary grammars for, for syntax. And for that, we have designed a uh, constraint generation language that maps f sex and x trees to uh, constraints. So what's the architecture? We take a program, we parse it, get an AST. Uh, from that AST, we, get, we generate constraints. And these constraints generation rules are language specific. That's what the language designer expresses. And then uh, given a set of constraints, we resolve these constraints, and that gives us a solution. And that operation is language independent. So we can reuse this, uh, this architecture this, uh, for uh, uh, a range of, uh, of languages. Um, so let me um, explain how this works. So, uh, so basically, the scope graph constraints correspond to the elements of scope graphs. So we can create new scopes. We can make edges uh, between scopes that are labeled. Uh, we can uh, declare a, uh, a declaration. Right? So here we're saying X is a declaration in scope S in the namespace N. So I haven't talked about namespaces, but you might want to distinguish functions from variables, uh, and namespaces are, allow you to do that. Um, the other way around is a, is a reference. So here X is a reference in scope S in namespace N. Uh, and then we have a, a resolution constraint. So these constraints all are basically building up a scope graph. And the resolution constraint says, well, given this reference x, find me its declaration d by finding a path in a scope graph that is visible, et cetera. Um, so these are the basic constraints. And then we have uh, uh, constraint generation rules that say, well, now generate me, the, give me the, the, the constraints for this expression given this scope. So let me illustrate you how, how that works. So here we have a program. We map it to its uh, AST. And uh, what we're going to do is build up, well, we have a scope from, uh, from the context. And what we're going to do is uh, build up uh, the scope graph given constraint generation rules uh, over here. Right, this constraint generation rule matches our, uh, our lead binding structure. Right? We have a lead binding with a variable declaration and a body and some scope S. So what we're going to do is create a new scope as body. Uh, we make an edge to its uh, outer scope. We declare uh, X as a uh, declaration in that uh, body scope. Uh, and then we recursively generate constraints for the, uh, for the expression over there, so the in initialization expression. And note here that we are using the scope S uh, to generate those constraints, right, because the uh, we then encounter the variable uh, x over here. And uh, for variables, we have another constraint generation rule that, that matches on, on vars. And what it does is says, well, we generate a, uh, a, a, uh, a reference in scope s prime. So that's the scope s that we had there. Uh, and it uh, requires us to, uh, to resolve that, uh, that reference. 
Um, so in this case, we see, well, this, this X in this initialization expression, well, it doesn't resolve to anything we know here because it's, it's something, well, that it's not, it's free in this, in this expression, right? Uh, now, when we recursively apply that to the, uh, the body of the LED, uh, we, uh, we may go down and generate some more scopes. Uh, we use the same variable rule, which now generates a reference for X in, uh, in this scope, which we then resolve to uh, the reference in the, in the LED binding over here. All right, five minutes. Um, all right, so how about types? Um, well, we can, uh, our constraint language also uh, gives us uh, type constraints. So what we can do is say, well, the type of a declaration is uh, some type expression. Uh, we have type equality, subtype, uh, and uh, well, there are possible extensions. And, uh, uh, and then we can define uh, the, uh, the typed uh, constraints. So basically it's the same constraints, but now we associate types with expressions and with, uh, with, ref with uh, declarations and, uh, uh, and references. And this allows us to uh, uh, resolve the types. Uh, so uh, this, this resolution here resolves the declaration of the variable X over here, and, uh, and, and this constraint retrieves the type of that declaration, which is then the type that we infer for the uh, the, the variable. So in this way, we can uh, define a, a constraint generator that gives us the constraints for a program that, when solved, do both name and type uh, analysis for, uh, for our program. Um, so now I have a more uh, interesting example, uh, which is uh, type-dependent name resolution, which is exactly sort of the interesting case, but I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. But if you're really interested, then I crash my uh, summer school lecture on Thursday, and I'll uh, show that. All right, so what do we have? Uh, we have an approach for declaratively defining the name binding of programming languages. That consists both of a representation, scope graphs, and a, a declarative language in which we can define by means of constraint generation rules uh, how we map ASTs to scope and type constraints. And this gives us a language for talking about name binding in, uh, in programs. Um, so given these definitions now, what we can do is generate all kinds of language independent tooling uh, that works with, uh, with types. And uh, so we have implemented this approach in the Spoofax <coughs> language workbench. And so you write your uh, constraint generation rules and what you get is not only an editor that's syntax aware, but also an editor that is type and name where you can do navigation, it does name checking, and et cetera. Uh, we're applying that to a bunch of, uh, of languages, so we're slowly scaling up to more realistic things. It's still a work in progress. Uh, we also have an approach to connect this to semantics of programming languages, more in my summer school lecture. And uh, so what's the status? So we have a theory uh, that's this resolution calculus uh, that uh, gives us name binding and type constraints and a name resolution algorithm that is sound with respect to the calculus. And we have this mapping to runtime uh, memory layout. And we have a language for defining the, the name binding rules uh, called Enable2. And we have tooling to go with this. So we have a solver, solver that's now uh, getting acceptably fast. Uh, well, acceptably slow, I, I guess you should say. Uh, and this is integrated in the, uh, in the Spoofx language workbench where you can use it. And uh, you get editors with name and type checking and navigation. And uh, so this has, so what, what are the limitations? It's a domain specific model. So what we can do, uh, so the practice for name binding is Turing complete algorithms and compilers. We cannot hope to do cover all of those algorithms. Uh, so this really is kind of a normative model that says, well, this is what name binding is. Now the question is, how, is that adequate? Right? And, and that requires uh, experimentation. I think it, it does cover sort of sane uh, uh, name binding models. Uh, I think that's a good thing. Just like using context free grammars for your syntax gives you a sane model for your, the syntax of your language. Um, so there's still 
uh, room for future work. So these scopes are really interesting, uh, it seems, as uh, a model for structural types, but that requires operations on comparing uh, scopes. Uh, we're still struggling with generics, but there's an idea to use uh, dependent object types. Uh, inspired by dependent object types, there seems to be a solution there. Uh, we're working on type sounders of interpreters uh, automatically, and that uh, uh, is progressing well. And there's a bunch of things to do in, in getting tooling more performant, doing incremental analysis, uh, et cetera. Um, so to conclude, uh, I presented scope graphs uh, to re to, uh, as a solution for, for name binding. Uh, what I hope it, that this will provide us a uh, common cross-language uh, understanding of name binding and a foundation for uh, formalization and implementation of programming languages. And I would be very interested in your, uh, your feedback uh, offline or uh, otherwise. And uh, thank you. I guess we're out of time. So let me ask by giving you one example of dirty hacks that, that may be done in, in some languages, mm -hmm. asking whether this could be translated. Uh, imagine that in a function, if it declares a return type, uh, you want to uh, resolve the identifier result to a synthetic uh, variable of that type of the yes. function. Is, that, is your approach uh, yes. able to do yes. that? Yes, yes, that's fine. You can just make up names. They don't have to come from uh, from the program. Yes. Um, that's it. All right. Thank you.